afternoon and good evening to all our speakers, chairs and the wonderful audiences of ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another episode of very educative lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Taiwan, Professor Shin Chong Ling. Dr. Lin is the Professor of Neurosurgery and Superintendent of Hualien Suchi Hospital, Taiwan. He is a Fellow of the American Association of Advanced, Advancement of Sciences as well as the International Fellow of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. He is the Co-Editor-in-Chief of the journal Cell Transplantation. He was the Chairman of the 10th Pan-Pacific Symposium on Stem Cells and Cancer Research. His clinical interests are focused upon brain tumors and specifically gliomas. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar as speaker and today we will be talking about interstitial wafers and clinical trials in glioma. The speaker for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from the USA, Professor Arno Bennett. Dr. Bennett is currently a resident at the Barron Neurological Institute from 2017 onwards. He was a past research fellow for the Minimal University Neurosurgery Laboratory at the University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Medical Center, and later on he was an assistant professor at the Department of Neurosurgery and Otolaryngology and the director and founder of the UCSF Skull Base and Cerebrovascular Laboratory. He did his PhD from University of Barcelona and he has authored more than 160 peer-reviewed publications and 10 book chapters including Humans Chapter 3 Skull Base Anatomy and Thought Neurosurgery anatomy internationally. We are extremely honored to have today at our webinars and today we will be talking about neuroanatomy of the orbitozygomatic approach. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our distinguished senior faculty from Japan, Professor Yoshitaka Narita. Professor Narita is a professor and head of department of neurosurgery and neuro-oncology at the National Cancer Center Hospital, Tokyo, Japan. He is the co-chair Neuro-Oncology Education Committee, Federa World Federation of Neurosurgery and director of the Japan Society of Neuro-Oncology and Japan Neurosurgical Society. He also serves as the head of the Committee of Brain Tumor Registry of Japan and the Committee on Guidelines. He has also served as a director of the Japan Society of Intraoperative Imaging and Japan Awake Surgery Association. He specializes in the treatment of gliomas, malignant brain tumors, neuro-oncology and molecular biology. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor, Professor Shin Chong Ling. The chair for the second session of today is our honored guest from Germany, Professor Felix Gore. Dr. Gore is an adjunct professor of neurosurgery at the University of Helsinki, Finland, and is also the consultant neurosurgeon at the Bergman Stroth Hospital, Halle, Germany. He is a cerebrovascular expert who is also an invited faculty to various workshops and conferences all around the world, and he is a noted author with several publications in various peer reviewed journals. He is the author of the book titled Post Circulation Aneurysms. We are extremely thankful to Professor, Ho professor Felix Gore for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Arnab Banat. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online podium of ACNS webinars. So a very warm welcome to all our colleagues in China and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. For, with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Yushitaka Narita. Okay, you can start. Ladies and gentlemen, first I'd like to thank the, uh, the teams. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Xin Zhong Lin, English name Zhang Lin. I'm the president of Hualien Suji Hospital, Taiwan. And uh, I also a professor of neurosurgery at the Tsuji University. I'm one of the inventor of uh, this pattern. And this uh, uh, clinical trial, phase one and two phase trial, involved three medical centers in Taiwan. The reason why we have conducted this quick trial is that the, this is a unmet medical need for treatment of GBM because currently recurrent GBMs only can survive six to nine months. So uh, we like to uh, test to test these uh, new drugs. <clears throat> Everybody knows many uh, famous uh, people died of the uh, GBMs, including uh, in the uh, USA and Taiwan. 
So uh, 20 years ago, we started to, to develop uh, this uh, new drug called the cell breaker wafers. And uh, after can finish uh, almost 20 uh, patients uh, trial, we think this is maybe the first choice for surgical combinations currently. 20, 30 years ago, in, uh, uh, for new for GBM treatment, at that time, we used a gradient wafer, which contains 3.85 BCNU. But uh, they can only uh, extend the median overall survival by 6.4 months with the implantation of eight wafers, radio wafers. But uh, the adverse uh, effect of this drug involved in the uh, delay when healing and uh, also uh, may cause brain edema and epilepsy. So we start to develop this uh, minimized side effect new drug. This uh, also, we call this a cell breaker wafer, which contains 25% of the uh, APIs EF001 which is the small molecular nature compound. And uh, the, the implantation methods of this uh, Cerebrica wafer is similar to the Gridio wafer. And uh, now it says uh, US FDA and the Taiwan FDA approved the two-way trial. And the target for this new drug is the receptor type of kinase inhibitor. The greedy wafer, which is the uh, contains uh, three point eight five percent BCNU, is a non-specific chelating agent. In preclinical efficacy study, the the uh, greedy wafer has the extend the uh, animal life one point five four for the preclinical study of this cell breaker wafer new drug extend 3.64 versus the brink wafers. And uh, the six wafer effects on this uh, uh, trial patients now currently is 15.1 months versus the video uh, wafer 6.4 four months, eight wafers. And up to now, we did not see any adverse effect for this uh, new uh, cell breakout wafer implantation in the brain. And the SI developed video wafer and mainly caused the poor uh, wind healing in 15%. The most advantage of this new drug contains first, this Zebraca wafer drug can uh, clear, can kill in the cancer stem cells, GBM stem cells. Second, they can resensitize the uh, TMG, Tamato resistance tumor so that uh, this uh, clinical trial is the combination of the tomato and uh, after imprint this is a breakout wafer so they have the chemo the tomato synergistic effect and uh, the other uh, important uh, point is that the breakout wafer can shut down the PDL1 expression in uh, GBM cells. So 
they can uh, help immune activation so that the uh, immunity of the patients to uh, GBM uh, can be uh, improved. So this is the uh, it has simple illustration of the uh, the uh, Sebreka waiter uh, uh, target target, which uh, may bind to XCO1 receptor, uh, and uh, so that they uh, killed the uh, GBM uh, stem cells. They have the uh, the shut down uh, the MGMT activity, so they have the thematal resensitization and uh, uh, has the synergistic effect uh, with the TMG uh, therapies. And they also suppress PDL1, so they have the uh, immune activation ability. So this is the uh, we uh, publish uh, this. Uh, uh, fundamental molecular uh, mechanism studies at this uh, journal. And uh, here, after uh, introduce the, uh, B, B, this BP, which uh, uh, is the API of the uh, Sebreka wafer drug. So they can, uh, they can, you see the MGMT can be a shutdown so that uh, they can resensitize, resensitize uh, the uh, the thematal resistance uh, cancer cells, GBM cells. Uh, so it's uh, in the dose dependent type. In contrast, BCNU, although administered at the very high concentrations, this uh, uh, this drug resistance uh, GBM cell also have the high expression of the MGMT. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, the appearance of the Sebreka wafer uh, around 1.2 centimeter in diameter uh, pieces of the drug. And after resection of tumor, we we can uh, imprint on the uh, resection surface of the uh, GBM uh, after GBM surgery. Here, the simple uh, illustrations why they can synergistic uh, effect or resynthesize thematol to treat this recurrent tumor. Most of the uh, recurrent tumor already uh, as the uh, TMG, thematol resistance, because they have the very high level MGMT uh, expressions. Uh, for this new drug, after resection of the tumor, here, the uh, recurrent, in recurrent tumor, they become the uh, they have the high expression of MGMT and they become the temato resistance. But if you uh, if you do the uh, uh, resection of the uh, recurrent tumor again and put in put in Sebreka wafer, this Sebreka wafer can uh, uh, resensitize and shut down MGMT and uh, we synthesize this uh, recurrent tumor to temato, And uh, also the, uh, the cell breakout wafer also can cure the uh, tumor cell, can cure the tumor stem cell. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, drug also uh, can uh, photosensitize if this uh, uh, tumor receive uh, radiotherapy. So the, this is the protocol for we uh, conduct, conducted the phase one trial, which is the uh, core, uh, the uh, three, three, three core uh, phase one uh, trial. So the one, one piece of the survey 
calf waiver in three patients call one. If there's no uh, side effect, then we move to call two, uh, two pieces of the uh, cerebral calf waiver, and then move to call three, uh, four keys, and uh, proceed to six, uh, six pieces of the uh, call four. And uh, now we finish this call one to four, to four in 12 patients. Now we are uh, using a cohort four, six uh, pieces of wafers to uh, treat uh, more uh, 10 patients uh, to finish phase two trial. And uh, the, uh, the primary uh, end point is the overall survival and the secondary uh, end point is the progression free Operation free survivals and uh, uh, actually, and uh, uh, the most important thing is to watch uh, whether there's any adverse effect of this uh, drug. So, we uh, include uh, the patient with uh, recurrent GBM, urinator tumor in cerebrum, and uh, uh, they have uh, the uh, around uh, one centimeter cavities where we put uh, these uh, cerebral wafer uh, drugs. <clears throat> uh, the first uh, question we ask is whether there's any neurotoxicity after imprint in uh, uh, cranial cerebral wafers. So, and uh, the answer is uh, no. So I'd like to, uh, to illustrate this case, uh, Mr. Wang, 85 uh, years old and uh, uh, 2020 uh, he was diagnosed as the GBM grade 4 and uh, he uh, received surgery radiotherapy and uh, tomato uh, therapies one one more year later uh, the tumor recurred and uh, uh, patient's neurological function wasn't so he was recruited uh, for this uh, this one trial. So uh, actually, this is the cohort four uh, patients. Uh, we implant six uh, cerebral wafers into the uh, the resection uh, tumor beds. So, and uh, he was hospitalized in in ICU. Uh, one night, second day, uh, he was moved to the uh, ordinary uh, 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 ordinary rooms. Uh, here is the, the patient's recurrent tumor. Uh, after resection, we implant six cerebral car wafer pieces into the resection surface. And then we close the uh, dura, bone, and wound. So this is uh, before and after tumor resection. <laughs> so you can see the second day in the morning. Uh, so he uh, he can talk, can calculate, can walk, no motor and sensory deficit, uh, which means uh, second day uh, means the uh, drug concentration uh, here on the second day we uh, routinely follow up uh, the uh, the mri the ct and, and uh, mri again to see uh, uh, how much tumor we resected and whether there's uh, any uh, operation complications so this day the patient uh, uh, at, at the time the drug concentration in a uh, brain is very, very high, but to, but the patient can uh, speak and calculate, no personality change, uh, have a very good cognitive function, and he can walk, can say, and so uh, without any uh, uh, brain uh, dysfunction. So this is for up two months, four months, six months, and uh, now uh, the, the patient uh, uh, still keeps very uh, good conditions so so the summary is that uh, we uh, did not see any uh, side effect 
uh, in these patients after imprint six uh, cerebral wafers uh, in their into their uh, resection tumor beds. So, and and the overall uh, now uh, the uh, in our uh, clinical trial patients, uh, we did not see any uh, drug related adverse effects or severe adverse effect. And we publish uh, this uh, paper uh, here. And uh, uh, we can see uh, if they compare this new drug, Celebrica wafer, with video wafer, uh, the survival at six months for uh, low dose, one piece, two piece, and uh, uh, four piece, the six months overall survival uh, is. Uh, it's, 67% uh, while the video wafer only 58 pieces, a 55.6%. Uh, and the over one to four, 75%, if we only calculate, calculate six pieces of the uh, wafers, there's a 100% uh, survival at six months. So it's a very uh, uh, exciting result to us. And uh, up to now, uh, the median uh, overall survival for uh, low dose, uh, one to four uh, cerebral wafers, uh, the median survival uh, is 12 months. And for uh, six patients, cerebral wafer patients, now it's more than uh, uh, 19.5 months compared to eight species of the greedy wafer, the uh, medium survival is 6.4 months. So uh, the low, so the conclusion that low dose level of the cerebral wafer survive rate at six months was not inferior, inferior to greedy wafer in dosing eight species. In subgroup analysis, median survival of the cerebral wafer treatment was superior to video wafers. In treating six species of cerebral wafers, median overall survival was improved by one year at least, with a median uh, overall survival of 19.5 months, which is three four higher than the video wafer. So. Uh, the uh, cerebral wafer versus video wafer is uh, at least three, four overall survival more than the uh, the video wafers. Here, the uh, the cerebral wafer uh, for more than six, the progression free survival at six months is 100%. And for Temato, 22%. For Avastin, 44%. And for uh, six months uh, survival for uh, video wafer only six percent, but cerebral wafer a hundred percent. So for the uh, maxima, the high dose six species dose now uh, the cerebral cerebral wafer uh, is more than nineteen point five uh, months, and uh, video wafer only uh, 6.4 uh, months. And uh, uh, this, I'd like to uh, talk uh, more deeply about the uh, down regulation of the MGMT expression by using Cerebrica wafer. Also, a Cerebrica wafer in inhibits the uh, GBM uh, stem cell growth. <clears throat> this is the uh, case Case, case one, uh, uh, overall survival is uh, more than uh, one year. No dose, one wafer. Uh, this is the uh, pre recurrent GBM cases, pre-operation. Second day uh, operation, the wafer coverage 25.9% of the surface of the resection uh, bed. And that is a uh, one month, two months, and uh, three months result. So it's uh, uh, stabilized the 
the uh, the reception the uh, the surgery results. So this patient overall survival thirteen months, uh, eighty six years old. This patient is ITH wild type, uh, tomato resistance, and uh, uh, because this patient's GBM cells uh, can contains ninety four percent CD one thirty three uh, positive stem cells. Also, uh, SOX two uh, positive cells uh, include uh, in this in this uh, GBM cells uh, is over ninety. And reference means the uh, the uh, the non uh, GBM uh, resistance, non uh, non uh, video wafer resistance cases around uh, twenty percent. Such uh, two positive cells contain five to ten percent, but in this case, more than ninety percent. And uh, you can see the uh, IC fifty for of a cell breakout wafer is around uh, two, uh, four, two, uh, 420 uh, micromole. For BCNU, it's uh, more than 2,000 micromole. So it means uh, it's the, uh, uh, did not respond to BCNU wafer. For Temato, uh, the IC50, 300 uh, micromole. If uh, you imprint, uh, yeah, the breakout wafer there. On the second day, we start uh, to uh, to uh, ask patient to uh, take a uh, temato. So the synergistic effect can lower down the uh, IC50 temato IC50 down to two uh, hundred. So we sensitize here the the temato MGMT expression in the uh, placebo. In those dose, high dose, uh, uh, if you uh, put two drugs together, the MGMT uh, shut down completely, means uh, which uh, uh, is not a uh, temato resistance. So we uh, here, uh, we also like to uh, present uh, uh, one uh, low dose, one wafer cases. So uh, the, this patient, uh, one year later, recurred and uh, include this uh, uh, trial, low uh, dose, uh, uh, one piece trial, and uh, we analyze the the IC50 for the uh, patient's uh, uh, GBM cell culture, primary cell culture, uh, including the stemnis the expression of PDA-L1 and the expression of MGMT. You have the patient, if the resection of the tumor, here, resection of the tumor, and then here, the uh, follow-up. Yeah. The second day uh, after the uh, day three, after the uh, surgery, and uh, here, uh, it's a very uh, stable uh, in uh, two weeks. So this is subject show improved the, the uh, KPS score and uh, they uh, survive uh, uh, for a, a very uh, uh, extended uh, times and patients uh, sample the primary GBM culture show uh, the uh, very high expression of the MGMT and uh, uh, after the uh, uh, if we add the cell breakout waiter, uh, we uh, shut down the MGMT uh, expression means we sensitize the tumors to the temato uh, reuse. And uh, they, uh, whether the cell breakout waiter can turn the correlation, immune suppression lesion into heart uh, activation lesion. This is the uh, another case, progression for six months, low dose, two wafers. This is the before surgery and after surgery. There's a, uh, because this is a very important motor area. So we left uh, around more than 50% uh, of the tumor there. And then 
uh, we implant the cell break heart wafer. Five months after the tumor shrinked, and uh, uh, this is the uh, GBM stem cell, cancer stem cell. Uh, this patient primary cell culture contain 91 uh, CD133 positive cell, uh, almost 90%, over 90% of the SUX2 positive cell. And this is the VCU IC50 temato. IC50, if you put temato with uh, this uh, uh, several cup wafer together, they uh, lower down uh, the, uh, the IC50s. And the, uh, here, the uh, PTO1 uh, shut down from 50% uh, to 20% of the tumor cells. And uh, the interferon GABA can elevate. Uh, uh, up to uh, two four, up to one hundred forty. So uh, compared to BCNU, uh, this is a very hard wafer uh, inhibits abundant cancer stem cells, and uh, combined of the low dose temato, uh, they can have the synergistic effect through the uh, MGMT tongue regulation. The Sebeka uh, wafer reduce PDL one. Uh, uh, expression and increase interferon gap uh, to turn correlation into hydration. So this is uh, why uh, this uh, nature compound, this is the, uh, this is small molecule uh, are very uh, effective uh, to uh, kill in the cancer cell among also the cancer stem cells. Uh, and here, uh, we'd like to show uh, another uh, case is 50 years old, is young here. The, uh, after recurrent, they have the huge uh, involvement in patients' right brain. So he joined uh, this uh, trial. And uh, we also com confirmed that they can uh, have the tematosynergistic effect, have the uh, immune activation effect, uh, etc. cetera. Yeah. Yeah, this the patient and the third section. We took two keys of the uh, of the uh, drug into this huge. And that they, yes, the, oh, so there's no so the, before surgery, he already had the left hemiparty. But after surgery, he has the uh, a, a very uh, small improvement in his left hand uh, movement. So uh, this is the basic molecular study for this cell breakout wafers. And uh, we also like to, to, to know uh, whether this drug uh, can uh, spread uh, into the uh, tumor, uh, residual tumors. Here, uh, this is the uh, the uh, case which uh, was imprint six cerebral wafers uh, on day two, two months, six months, twelve months, twenty six months. So uh, the tumor disappeared, and the uh, the tumor stem cell contains uh, eighty four percent substitute positive. Uh, uh, contains 80 uh, percent of the cells and the they they have a very remarkable uh tematosynergistic effect also uh, can shut down uh, can shut down the uh, the pdl1 uh, expression also uh, elevate interferon gaba expression so uh, again uh, this uh, new drug they have uh, several uh, uh, molecular mechanisms. They can synergistic uh, with the temato. They uh, they can uh, uh, kill the uh, cancer stem cell. Uh, they can uh, shut down PTO one expression in cancer cell. They elevate the uh, the interferon gamma levels uh, to uh, activate patients' uh, uh, immunities. So uh, here, uh, uh, six wafer, high dose, uh, 
a patient 66 years old, they have limbic weakness, and uh, wait for uh, wait for a patient that the limbic weakness. So we implant the six uh, wafers and uh, uh, discharge the soon. And uh, here, uh, so we analyze again uh, IC50 PDL1 in the GABA uh, with a very uh, uh, confirmed again and again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the second day, yeah. the uh, OPD, this is very good. So, 20 months, very good. So, uh, immediately after the uh, the surgery with implantation of the cerebral car waiver, they improved the KPS and uh, the uh, progression free extent over 26 months uh, with uh, six cerebral car waiver. And uh, uh, they can uh, uh, live uh, by himself, by herself. So, uh, this is the uh, the unresectable uh, GBN in the uh, cervical core. Uh, this is also a, a, a recurrent GBN, but the GBN is not in the brain. It's, it's in the spinal cord. So we applied the compassionate uh, trial and we published uh, this uh, paper uh, uh, here. Yeah. So uh, the uh, after here the tumor, the uh, we did the uh, limited reception for culture for pathology, and uh, three months after the uh, tumor regressed, eight months disappeared. So, uh, so this is the uh, GBM uh, spinal cord GBM patient also uh, cerebral wafer. Uh, was used and uh, was very useful. And here, uh, uh, the whether we needed to uh, to conduct a, a more than ninety percent resections, so that to extend the patient's uh, uh, the, the patient's uh, survival rate. And uh, in in our. Uh, uh, early uh, phase 2a uh, result we said that we uh, don't need to uh, to uh, to do the very extended resection of the tumor because uh, uh, frequently this uh, extensive resection of tumor may uh, leave behind a very uh, big neurological deficit like hemiparesis aphasia coma etc so we only uh, we only do a, a very uh, uh, careful uh, tumor remove, uh, a very uh, limited tumor remove for diagnosis, for culture, for precision uh, gene therapy, uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, we uh, leave the uh, the uh, tumor there so that we can keep patients. Uh, uh, neurological function well. So here, uh, the, here. So uh, we publish this idea uh, at uh, this uh, journal. So I like to uh, to uh, share with you this case. Forty three years old, uh, uh, recurrent and the recurrent GBMs, and uh, every uh, outstanding neuro neurosurgeons uh, did not uh, see any hope for this case. And uh, here uh, we did the uh, the uh, uh, surgery limited resection of the tumors and left uh, lots of the tumors behind uh, in the patient's uh, blood brain. But you see, uh, the second day preparation, second day, and uh, uh, one month at the resection, three months, six months, eleven months, uh, one and a half uh, months. 12 months, the, the tumor, this is the uh, one resection, the uh, another resection uh, of the uh, MRI, you see the tumor uh, disappeared and the, uh, the uh, brain volume uh, shrink 
uh, a little bit because the tumor disappeared. So here, here is the patient's two years after the tumor. He, he can say very good. Uh, he is the ophthalmologist doctors uh, before uh, surgery because uh, he suffered three times uh, uh, brain surgery and that we did uh, the last. Uh, so the, uh, after surgery, he can speak and keep his function well uh, up to two more years. So he can a uh, very good cognitive function. He can teach uh, patients about the eye uh, care and his wife and his daughter. So, so uh, uh, it's look it's that, that this uh, untreatable and resectable uh, recurrent GBM can be uh, treated uh, this uh, 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 cerebral wafer. But this patient, because it's a compassionate trial, uh, we also add some uh, CIK immune cell uh, uh, combined therapies. Uh, so that the outcome with this patient uh, is very, very good. The patients uh, are still uh, alive and uh, uh, can live along, uh, can also uh, conduct the uh, ophthalmology uh, care uh, teaching for patients. And that we, we uh, published uh, this, uh, uh, the cerebral wafer API, we call it the VP. Uh, VP, uh, uh, is uh, synthesized chemicals, but uh, contains mainly in Tangue. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we synthesize this BP and the purity for BP is 99.99% uh, .99%, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, patient's trial use. And uh, uh, this uh, Tangue uh, has the uh, NT uh, as here, uh, this uh, Chinese herb is a pure compound, so he can uh, activate MPEG, AMPK uh, gene. And we call this a uh, HAP gene. And uh, this HAP gene keep the cell in the balanced uh, state. If the cell move to uh, cancer, like uh, uh, recurrent GBN, this HAP gene, MPK gene, can bring back this uh, uh, oncogenes back to normal. And this uh, uh, drug BP also can, uh, can involve in the uh, apoptotic cells, the uh, dying uh, gene, or they can activate the uh, rejuvenation genes to bring back the dying cell into a normal cell. So uh, now we are currently test this drug in uh, motor neuron disease, in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So uh, the nature compound, small molecular uh, uh, APIs, had, like the BP has the, uh, has the keep in yeah, balance, uh, like the hub genes keep cell in the uh, homeostatic state. Not uh, if deviated to a cancer cell, then it can uh, cause it uh, bring it back to uh, make this cancer cell uh, uh, disappeared. And also, uh, if this uh, dying cell, the Alzheimer's disease, they can rejuvenate these uh, cells into, uh, uh, into a normal state. So uh, it has the anti-cancer effect, also has the anti-aging effect. So this is a characteristic of this uh, nature compound small drug, they uh, can, uh, can uh, affect the heart genes, keep cell in a very uh, homeostasis. So our conclusion is this, many subjects show excellent prognosis. So breakout wafer is potentially one of the best choice for surgical combination to treat the GBM. Uh, Everfront Biotech Inc. is ready to finish this uh, phase one, two A study and quickly to initiate phase two B, uh, three A study uh, plan via multi center nations. Uh, so, uh, here, welcome you all to uh, Taiwan, Hualien, uh, which is located in the eastern Taiwan. And uh, this uh, 
these uh, medical centers was built by Master Zheng Yuan uh, 36 years ago. Uh, this is a place uh, now Master Zheng Yuan living just uh, 10 kilometers away from the uh, hospital. So uh, uh, we call this uh, uh, very gan en, means uh, we sent to you all. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Sin Zon Li, uh, he presents the efficacy of uh, cerebral wafer and congratulations for uh, his good uh, phase one results. Thank you so much. Oh, it's very difficult to get, get on the uh, connection. So any question? Uh, okay. Um, my name is Narita from Japan. Uh, yes. thank, thank you for a nice lecture. And congratulations for your good phase one results. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, the mechanism and the effect of cerebral wafer uh, sounds very good. And uh, do you plan to do a phase three a randomized clinical trial by cerebral wafer yes. versus vision sure. wafer? Sure, phase two B and the three. Yes. But because this is the uh, rare disease and dying disease, so we like to conduct the phase two B, a, a double brand control study at uh, a multi nation, a multi center fashion. Okay. And then uh, see whether we can get a temporary license so we can uh, uh, promote to phase three, uh, multi nation, multi centers to help more uh, GBM cases. Uh, will you do uh, that clinical trial in Taiwan? Um, Currently, yes, uh, to, to 2A and uh, uh, possibly move to 2B very quickly. Okay. Okay, and uh, treatment of spinal GBM by cerebral wafer uh, looks very interesting. Yes, uh, uh, we, we have this kind of the competence. It's a very, uh, almost uh, can cure the uh, recurrent GBM cases, although we only uh, remove part of the tumors, we made, uh, left the uh, uh, tumors uh, behind very much, but the, this drug can uh, eradicate the uh, residual cells in the uh, brain. Uh, I think it's uh, very uh, powerful. And this uh, cerebral wafer also can have the uh, combination use of the uh, the antibody, uh, like the PDL1 antibody, PD1 antibody, or with the CIK immune cell, other immune cell therapies. So you see, uh, uh, of ophthalmologist doctors, 43 years, he uh, suffered or received three times of of the surgery at the mainland China, and with uh, uh, almost recurrent tumor occupied his uh, right brain. But here, uh, if he uh, moved to Taiwan, and uh, we imprint the six uh, pieces of Cerebeca wafers. And the follow up now, it's almost uh, 26 months. And uh, the doctor in mainland China told us that he cured. And uh, his function, his brain function is very good. He can walk, uh, can uh, very good. Uh, uh, calculation, cognitive function, and also he can teach uh, patients how to uh, take care of their eyes. So uh, it's a uh, look very uh, promising. And, uh, uh, and we also see uh, they, uh, they can uh, synergistic effect with the uh, uh, tematol. We sensitize uh, drug tematol resistance uh, GBM cells to uh, uh, sensitize one and uh, by by shut down the MGMT expression. I think it also can uh, work synergistically with uh, BCNU. They also can uh, resensitize BCNU from uh, uh, the IC50 more than 2,000 micromore uh, down to, uh, down to uh, uh, 300. So uh, if uh, uh, I think it's maybe a combination of the gradual wafer and the cerebral wafer in these uh, put these two kinds of wafer uh, simultaneously after the uh, the removal of part of the recurrent GBM uh, tumors. I think these two drugs also, uh, if put together, they can also uh, a very good synergistic effect to uh, uh, eradicate remaining. Uh, 
uh, the tumor, uh, the drug resistance DBMs. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I have one question uh, regarding to uh, the treatment of spinal glioma by cerebral wafer or BCNE wafer. Uh, do you experience to use BCNE wafer uh, for spinal glioma? Uh, uh, our uh, case, uh, this case report is showed that no, because uh, the recurrent GBM cases also has the uh, resistance to BCNU therapy up to uh, IC52,000 micromole. So it means you can't uh, uh, cure the uh, recurrent G spinal GBMs by BCNU wafers. But uh, in this case, we only put Cerebrica wafer these are BP wafers and uh, uh, the, this unresectable GBM disappeared completely. Okay. So are there any questions from the audience? Professor Takashi Kon is here. Yes, mm -hmm. Professor Takashi Kon, any questions from your side? Uh, yeah, thank hello. you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you for the much informative lecture. And uh, compared with the greater wafers, so uh, it seems to be very effective, so um, very promising. So. I'd like to uh, listen to the, uh, I'd like to use in Japan uh, someday. And uh, as for side effects, so uh, the using side effects, uh, we uh, experience greater reference, uh, some uh, air pollution uh, or sometimes uh, wound, uh, wound healing uh, delay. So, but did you have there's a new uh, the drug compared with uh, some kinds of uh, side effects compared with greater reference? Yes. Uh there's no any uh, side effect, including the, the delay when healing, uh, infection, or any uh, brain swelling or uh, epileptic attack, etc. So it looks uh, very, uh, very uh, good. And mm. Almost no side effect. Uh, okay. After imprint the six uh, pieces of the wafer into the brain. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Good to Welcome. So we, we, we hope we can uh, have uh, a, a partner or like uh, excellent neurosurgeons to, uh, to have the uh, collaboration uh, mm. uh, clinical yeah, trials in Japan or in other countries. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Welcome. Any questions, Thank you. my co-host, Liu Bun Seng? Thanks, thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor, for, for showing us a, a, a new product that, that uh, probably a big through in the treatment of uh, uh, GBM. Uh, my question, Professor, you, you did show most of your cases uh, uh, the tumor in actual sense is shrink uh, within six months. And uh, also you have shown, demonstrate, most of them have a longer uh, progression uh, free survivor. May I know that uh, what happened to those uh, uh, shrink uh, tumor uh, when the patients start uh, becoming symptomatic? Uh, how how uh, does does the tumor spread uh, faster than uh, the usual uh, other cases that we used to see uh, in recurrent GBM, Professor? Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a there's a very uh, uh, me mechanism to uh, irradiate the remaining uh, tumor, especially tumor stem cells, in a very long distance because uh, cerebral car wafer contains. 25% of the API means the, the BP, uh, and the gradual wafer only contain 3.8% of the uh, BCNU. Uh, so it's a, uh, uh, but these two, uh, these two uh, IC50s are very similar to the primary, to the uh, first GBM cell lines. So it means there's a, a very, uh, very uh, eight folds. Uh, power or uh, eight, uh, eight folds uh, ability to uh, clear the uh, remaining tumors by imprint the cerebral wafers. And uh, in, uh, in our cases, 12 uh, uh, patients, uh, we, we uh, at the, uh, by using the primary cell cultures, we, uh, we can, uh, the IC50 of the BCNU are usually are very high, more than the 16,000 uh, microbore. It means it's uh, BCNU resistance. So in these uh, recurrent uh, uh, recurrent GBM cases, they they uh, this tumor uh, we expect cannot uh, respond to radio wafer. They but uh, 
uh, in our cases, they are very good response to Cerebrica wafers. And uh, I expect, uh, because if you put the two, those two uh, API, BCNU plus BP together, they also have the synergist effect. So the, the uh, BCNU resistance uh, also uh, uh, down to the sensitize to BCNU by uh, shut down the MGMT uh, uh, enzyme activities. So same to Temato, they shut down MGMT activities. So they resensitize to Temato. You know, every neurosurgeon know the re if you take uh, Temato for more than six months, the uh, tumors uh, become to uh, Temato resistance similar. If you uh, used BCNU uh, before, it, this uh, recurrent tumor uh, becomes the BCNU resistance. But if you put uh, these two together, Cerebrica wafer together with BCNU or Cerebrica uh, wafer uh, uh, with uh, Temato, oral Temato, uh, they have the synergistic effect. Uh, so that's why uh, these uh, uh, recurrent cases uh, 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 in our case, we imprint, after we imprint the Zebraica wafer, on the second post-operation days, we ask the patient start uh, taking uh, the uh, Temato again. Uh, one more question, Professor. In yes. your second case, you show a tumor at the parietal hospital region. Uh, how do you ensure the wafer are, are, are seated on, on the, the tumor bed? No, because yeah, it's all we, over the pack, do you use any tissue glue or whatsoever to put it in place, Professor? Yeah, we, we put the surgery cell, you know, the, the uh, surgery cell there, and uh, I put some glue on uh, the borders so that we uh, only <laughs> very simple uh, uh, technique to uh, fix the uh, cerebral wafer there. Thank you, Professor. Thank yeah. you very much. We had an impressive session and we are really, really looking forward to participate in future trials for this uh, Cerebreca wafers. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you so much. Ling for this wonderful presentation. May I ask Professor Narita to say the concluding remarks? Oh, okay. Uh, I expect uh, you are phase three clinical trial. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We, right. we hope we can uh, bring phase three trial very quickly. Okay. Uh, right. uh, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. It was indeed very wonderful session and we learned a lot. May I inform all of you viewers that this has been broadcasted on YouTube, WeChat and Zoom. And thanks to Professor Shubin who's broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. And as of now, we have around 500 people who have joined us live on all the platforms. Okay, yeah, I hope uh, after the Omicron uh, mm -hmm. disappear, we like to travel to every country to uh, share this experience with uh, uh, every uh, neurosurgeon and uh, hope uh, uh, we can help uh, these uh, GBM patients. I right. hope so. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. With that, I would like to invite our second chair, Professor Felix Gore, to say a short introduction and invite Professor Arnab Bennett for his lecture. Professor Gore, all yours. To an honor to introduce Arnab Bennett. He earned his medical degree from the University of Barcelona. Then he moved to US, worked in Philadelphia, then moved to San Francisco, worked in UCSF as director and founder of the anatomical lab. Then in 2017, he came to Barrow where I met him. And I had the opportunity to listen a few of his beautiful anatomical lectures. And it's my really pleasure to introduce Arno for this anatomical session. And I'm looking forward to his topic on the OC approach. So Arno, it's your lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Felix. Uh, it's always an incredible honor uh, to have your words of introduction. Thank you, Raja, again, for inviting me into the Asian CNS. It's a huge, huge privilege to be here. And um, as um, Felix was mentioning, um, before um, Barrow, I was at UCSF. And the 
uh, some of the pictures you'll you'll well all of the work you'll see uh, was done while I was there, um, and some of these <laughs> beautiful dissections are coming straight from some of my best fellows who, who were uh, from Asia. So um, it's a great heads off and a great returning uh, treat to be able to speak about uh, the orbitozygomatic and show some of the anatomy back uh, in this in this community. Um, so I was asked to speak about the orbitozygomatic approach. And um, for the youngest audience, uh, I would like them to understand the orbitozygomatic approach basically as the final complete um, progression of osteotomies that one can do uh, starting from the turional or the mini turional. So basically on your mind, you can construct this approach as a, a series of steps that incrementally allow you some better features to get into the uh, core of the skull. Um, in the barrel, we still favor the orbit zygomatic approach for lesions like <laughs> this one. Um, um, I'm gonna show if time allows a final case from Dr. Lawton that we did in, uh, in barrel of uh, cavernous malformation in the midline of the pons, upper pons mesencephalum. So um, for these lesions, we still use the orbitozygomatic. And if the lesion is um, closer to the pedicle and getting to the lateral part of the pedicle, uh, we may use an ipsilateral orbitozygomatic approach. If it is more towards the medial side, um, kind of medial to the exit root of the oculomotor nerve, then we favor the contralateral orbitozygomatic approach. So those are the things um, that we, um, the lesions that we think about <laughs> when we uh, favor the over design and approach in BNI. Um, so here we have a series of steps and uh, I hope that you uh, follow me into understanding what are the key landmarks to do this safely and efficiently. That's about trying to be the most efficient while guaranteeing safety here is the positioning, the head positioning typically is about 10 to 20 degrees to the contralateral side with neck extension. Um, it depends uh, where the lesion finally is and if it's a contralateral or ipsilateral approach that we may turn the head more or less. Uh, here you see depicted the incision and the incision for the orbitozygomatic approach depends on uh, the insertion of the hairline um, because what we want really is to be able to um, raise a flap that will allow us to see without tension the lateral rim of the orbit. So we are gonna go through the orbitozygomatic approach surgical simulation on the left side. So I'll um, guide you through that. This first picture is just to show you that the um, dissection on the orbitozygomatic, orbitozygomatic approach before we do any osteotomies or craniotomies deals with this two very important structures, the STA and the facial nerve. So here is just to say in this picture that <laughs> we will raise a flap. We will see the superficial temporal artery first and we have a good amount of anterior space to continue dissecting until the facial nerve gets in the way. And it is important for our incision on the different flaps of fascia that we're gonna raise to keep that facial nerve safe. And I invite you to see that uh, zygomatic arch and see that the posterior third of the zygomatic arch is free from the nerve. So that's gonna be a safe point for an incision. I'll take you through those steps. So here we have um, uh, the mm, cutaneous flap raised and that is at the galea. We are seeing the a uh, superficial temporal artery through the galea. We dissected it out, we skeletonized it from the galea. And so that is a very interesting way of harvesting the artery for let's say an STA MCA bypass. And the reason why is because this artery is kind of lying, it's running on top of that galea and all these little arteries and branches are coming towards the skin, towards the subcutaneous fat. So if we are getting to the artery for exposure um, from the traditional perspective, from the skin down, we are basically seeing the branches and then the SDA. Whereas if we 
retract that flap, we can expose the <coughs> STA on the undersurface just after that layer of galia <coughs> with virtually no branches towards ourselves. So it's a little bit more efficient. But here, the important thing for the orbitozygomatic approach is that we're seeing the uh, fascias of the temporal muscle that we are going to discuss in a moment. And we see the galia. And the question is, when do we start minding about the facial nerve? If we were to go all the way on that plane, we would for sure damage the uh, temporal branch <laughs> of the facial nerve. So here is one of the keys of raising that flap. Here in this image, <coughs> excuse me, we see a cut through the galia. The arrow is showing you the galia. And under the galia, we see that facial nerve. And the facial nerve is happily packed in this subgalial fat pack that we can see here, right? This is the fat pack we do not want to see in that extent. We will end it, we will start seeing it. And at the, the point we see that subgalial fat pack is when we want to make sure we raise the flap of the facial nerve to protect it. Obviously, a mention of the main trunk of the STA. And the STA, just for you to know, at the level of the zygomatic arc, has a couple of hairpins so that if we damage the STA on our exposure for an STA MCA distally, we can go a little bit on the zygomatic arch just on top of the parotid gland. And we can harvest a little bit of those hairpins, straighten them up, and we have more. Uh, buffer of the actress. It's a little trick we published during that time. Behind it, just to mind for academic purposes, is the auriculotemporal nerve. Let's not forget about that one. Now, for those in the audience, especially the young ones and the ones that are passionate about skull base, take a screenshot of this one because this is the one uh, slide that I care the most. And uh, me and together with my fellows at UCSF, we took a lot of time, a lot of pride in making this slide and ending on a paper that you can see on PubMed that explains these planes of fascia makes a nomenclature that is simple to remember and useful, which is the key here. Because if we get lost on names, which we have maxillofacial, we have plastics, we have neurosurgeons trying to name these uh, fascias and planes, uh, it, it can end up in a non-useful nomenclature. So all what I'm going to say right now on this uh, image relates to these planes above the zygomatic arc, okay? A little bit below it's complex, but above is what we care. So it's fairly simple. Bear with me. We have the skin. We have cut the skin. We reach the galia, right? And up the galia, we saw on top of it, is the STA. See those little branches? These branches are coming up to the picture, not down. All right. Under the facial nerve, under the uh, galia, it's going to be the superior temporal fascia. And the superior temporal fascia is the one I'm retracting with these stitches. And if you continue that um, fascia uh, superiorly, you'll see that it's continuous with the pericranium. Okay, it's important because continuing the pericranium down is the superior temporal fascia. The superior temporal fascia inferior leaf at the level of the arrow, which is the zygomatic arc, it gets together, it fuses with the next fascia, which is below it, is the deep temporal fascia. And the deep temporal fascia, excuse me, let's put those arrows again. It's got the galia. We have the superficial temporal. We have the point where they merge again in the zygomatic arch. And the next, as we were mentioning, is the deep temporal fascia. <clears throat> and these basically are the two fascias that contain in the middle a nice pillow of fat. And that fat is the interfacial fat pad. And the interfacial fat pad basically contains no facial nerve. And the only thing that may contain it's a, <clears throat> the middle temporal vein and middle temporal artery. We'll talk about that. So that is <clears throat> one of the advantages to raise both fascias in the same time. Uh, you have that little pillow of fat that further protects the facial nerve, which, remember, is superficial to that superficial temporal fascia. 
Okay. <clears throat> I hope you follow. This is critical. Under that deep temporal fascia is the subfascial fat pad. That fat pad connects into uh, the face is the buccal fat pad. At the end is the fat pad of the shot. Why is it important? Well, if we're doing an anterior clinoidectomy, that's a good, generous fat pad, even in skinny people, that you can take a graft and plug for, um, to prevent CSF leakage into the sphenic sinus. So all of these layers have a use um, in neurosurgery. Let's see this beautiful, beautiful artery. Now, anatomy can be very simple. So this one is called the middle temporal artery. And the middle temporal artery is a branch, a distal branch of the superficial temporal artery. So we have the superficial temporal artery, the middle temporal artery. <clears throat> and as you can see, the middle temporal artery gets into the muscle as well as the fascia. So you can get the fascia and create a pedicle fascial a flap uh, for covering any defects if need to be. All right, the facial nerve again is above the superficial uh, temporal fascia. And again, this distance along the superior edge of the zygomatic arch that the facial nerve is in the anterior one to two thirds <coughs> on that zygomatic arch. Very important for our dissection. All right, so. Key here, we know the, fa the fascias and the planes. Let's see how that translates to our surgical simulation. And on the left, we see that star on that <clears throat> um, subgalial fat pad where the uh, facial nerve runs. And we see <coughs> our dissection, this beautiful loose areolar tissue that tells us we are in the right plane, subgalial. When we see the yellowish discoloration, that fat pad, that subgalial fat pad where the star is, is when we know that we should start caring about the facial nerve. We still have a little bit leeway, but that is the safer point to transition to <coughs> elevating the fascia. <coughs> Apologize for this cough. So right here, we see that a semicircular incision of the superficial temporal fascia. And if we raise that, we are keeping the facial nerve safe along with the galia, right? And in the middle, just at the very tip of the arrow <coughs> is the inner fascial fat pad. So this is the interfascial technique. You'll see it published. It was popularized by Dr. Spetzler at BNI. It's a way to get the minimum effort to get that facial nerve protected. And that fat pad is key to understand. If you see the fat pad and you see another layer of fascia, you are in the inner fascial technique. If you go all the way deep into the muscle, that's a subfascial technique. All right. So here we're raising it and we see that vein, the deep temporal vein, just for you to <laughs> anticipate there's always that vein and we have to be active to coagulate before we see it. Now, we see all those fascias retracted anteriorly um, with a facial nerve. And here's the key to any orbitozygomatic or any modified terrional approach, orbitothirional. See? And the next step is to detach what it is attached to the orbit and zygoma. And in the arrow, we have the muscle that attaches to the zygomatic arch. And that's the masseter. We have to dissect the masseter out. <clears throat> Here on top, we see the supraorbital nerve. And the supraorbital nerve sometimes is in a notch, most of the times. But in minimal cases, you'll have an actual foramen. And so some of uh, us, we prefer to crack that foramen open and free that supraorbital nerve and artery um, for uh, the retraction to not cause any problems because as you can see you need to see most of the uh, bone for the bone work especially in the zygomatic body so doing so will uh, prevent any stretch injury all right we have um, raised a pericranial 
uh, flap on the right side, it's pedicled and that's supraorbital artery. We have the temporal uh, muscle and here is key, it's key how to understand the temporal muscle and that relates to everything. Not only the orbit zygomatic, but also the temporal, the trional approach. So let's discuss very briefly about the uh, feeding of the muscle, the arteries that feed the muscle. And so the main feeding the main arteries feeling the temporalized muscle, you may know, are the deep temporal arteries. Remember, we have the superficial temporal artery, the middle temporal artery, and the deep temporal arteries. This is the main supply of the temporalized muscle. And these come from the pterygoid segment of the internal maxillary artery. So they're not coming from the ST anymore. <laughs> these are really deep, as they, uh, their name indicates. So we have Three actually, we have the anterior, we have the middle and the posterior. For our <coughs> main supply, it's gonna be the middle and the posterior deep temporal arteries. And here in this picture, you can see the middle temporal artery on this, on this arrow. Next arrow, it will indicate the posterior. See how they kind of uh, join together on the most basal part of the muscle. And anteriorly, we have the anterior deep temporal artery, which is basically a little network that also gets into the infraorbital fissure. That's why we, when we desiccate, we, we elevate the muscle posteriorly at that level, uh, we see some bleeding, oozing, because these are very small little art, um, arteries that feed the muscle at that level. So in general, for us to understand how the muscle gets its supply, we have the middle, temporal artery and the um, super, most superficial aspect. You can see here on the left-hand side, that's a minimal supply. The main supply is on the right by the deep temporal arteries. Okay, next is the middle meningeal artery. It's beautiful dissection. Um, uh, and in this dissection, what you can see is the star is laying on the <clears throat> sphenosquamosal suture. So the sphenosquamosal suture is a good landmark where we can see it to understand where the main trunk of the middle meningeal artery is going to be. It lays most of the times posterior, but we can see it a little bit anterior. But around that area is where we can see the main trunk of the middle meningeal artery. Okay, it gets tethered at the terion. So important to understand that when we elevate that flap for the youngest in the crowd, we go directly with the bipolar to bipolar, that tethering point where the middle meningeal artery gets into the inner table of the bone at the terion, at the sphenoid ridge uh, to prevent any undue bleeding. Now, one thing that is different for the orbital zygomatic that is not necessary for the terional or mini terional is dissecting down up to the infraorbital fissure. Right, and that's where our dissector is here on the left hand side. The inset shows in the start that infraorbital fissure. And what we are seeing is if we turn the dissector actually in the other side, in the extracranial, not the intraorbital, and we basically tickle that slope down, we will see a step down that is sudden. And that step down is showing us that we reach the infraorbital. Fissure, and that is going to be key for our osteotomies. We'll see it in a minute. Here in the yellow um, <clears throat> little arrow is showing the, the, the dissector um, uh, trajectory on the main picture. Now, when well, we're starting this craniotomy, it depends if we're doing a two-piece or a one-piece orbit zygomatic approach. Two-piece is the one we use all the time at BNI, but the one-piece got its little fashion time um, a couple decades ago, a decade ago. It allows picking the orbit zygomatic piece in one piece, as its name declares, but with some caveats. The most important thing, though, to plan one or the other is where you put the burr hole. The main burr hole for the two piece is the one that is popular for any mini terional or terional approach, which is the dandies. And the dandies is laying down at or below the superior temporal line and one finger breadth behind the orbital ring is the letter D. The letter C corresponds to the left lower picture inset. And you can see that's the critical one. It's called McCarty. 
And it's in a different region. See, it's way lower than the dandies. It's laying at the posterior projection of the frontozygomatic suture. And most importantly, it leads to both the orbit and the intracranial space, both at once. Going to be critical. It shows basically the same concept. Here is just to show with a little bit more detail that if we follow that frontozygomatic suture posteriorly, we can get also to the frontosphenoidal suture where the actual tip of the arrow is. And that's the actual point where um, McCarthy is, is between the zygomatic sphenoid suture is, the frontosphenoidal and the fronto zygomatic, where these three sutures lay together is the McCarty keyhole. It's the best to enter both spaces. All right. So let's review the orbizygomatic craniotomy with this <coughs> animation just to put ourselves into the ballpark of the cuts. So the first is going to be a terional. Okay. We can consider a mini terional. We don't need that much of the frontal exposure for the subfrontal approach. <clears throat> the next is going to be a cut on the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. This is a posterior cut that allows us to cut over there and free that posterior part. The next, or step number three, is an osteotomy on the zygomatic body. It's going to be a V-shape for cosmetic uh, reasons and requires entering into the infraorbital fissure. The fourth is going to be cutting through the orbital roof and most of this cut is going to be intracranial. And that's what it's a little bit difficult to understand just with uh, these little cartoons is how this really works. And the most difficult is connecting the fissures, which is the last one. You will connect the infraorbital with a supraorbital fissure. And that has a component that is extracranial and a component that is intracranial. So all that is difficult to understand just in these cartoons, in all these publications. Let's puzzle this up and understand it better. We have the terrional approach that we already know how to do. The next is <coughs> that zygomatic osteotomy. And the key point here is to understand two things. Well, just to do that cut on the black arrow direction, so from inferior to superior, and for two concepts, as I was saying. First, you don't wanna go on the trajectory of the red because the red gets us to the temporal mandibular junction. And if you do this cut through the black arrow, but you invert it and you go from above to below, then you can get to the facial nerve. So critical to really use it that way. We'll see a couple of images. Here is the actual craniotome position. The facial nerve is on the arrow and the temporal mandibular junction <clears throat> is basically at the root of this blue little stump that you can see here on the left, which is the superficial temporal vein. So deeper to that, it's gonna be not only temporal mandible injunction, but you can get actually into some of the anterior um, mastered air cells and complicate this unnecessarily with a CSF leak. So important to understand that little uh, detail. The next is gonna be doing these um, osteotomies on the zygomatic body. And before we get to the green arrow, let's see the red. The red line is that V-shaped cut, and this cut has one first component, which is the uh, black arrow on the right, <coughs> and the second. And the second is key, because the second <coughs> osteotomy starts from the inferior orbital fissure, right? And then meets the other uh, osteotomy line. So that's key. Let's review some of the more obvious and less obvious anatomy of the orbit that is pertinent to the orbit zygonic approach. So first, as you can see here on the green arrow, is the superior orbital fissure. We get to get there uh, through our intracranial um, dissection. The next one is the infraorbital fissure that we can see. Wow, so many arrows. Uh, the next is the optic strut that uh, separates the superior orbital fissure with the optic canal. And we can see two other arrows here that are very interesting. The first one, let's see if I can actually get here. Do you see my mouse? Hopefully. Here and here are the two little 
uh, nerves uh, or foramen that may escape your memory. This one is the zygomatical facial foramen for the zygomatic facial nerve. And that is important. It's a minute nerve, sometimes bigger. You can dissect it off. And if you could then bring these cuts and protect it, bring them posterior to that nerve, because that nerve is coming from V2. And actually the zygomatical facial nerve is the one that supplies the cheek. So for those of you in the audience that like the kisses in the cheek, that's the nerve that is responsible. Now, the one on top here is the foramen of Hertel. And here you can see in my note, it comes with a meningolacrimal artery and that can get in the central artery of the retina in a minority of cases. That's a minority of cases, but if we can see, we, we should protect it. All right. So hopefully uh, somebody learned something. I am really passionate about these little things that not escape our attention. So here the important thing is the next step is going to be cutting the roof of the orbit. And we get from our terrenal approach up top and up down to the arrowhead, which is in the most lateral part of the superior orbital fissure, where the star is, right? That is what we can see here on the skull on the right. It's going to be done intracranially with a microscope. We'll see it in a moment. And the final one is the difficult to see. We'll see it very clearly in the surgical simulation video. We'll see in a moment. But basically, the square is the inferior orbital fissure outside of the cranium. We'll basically um, do a connecting cut, and then everything comes out. Let's see all this together in this video. It's a surgical simulation. It's on the left side. We're going to go through all this hopefully to make sense in one surgical simulation. That's exactly what we would do in the OR. <coughs> we should have 10 to 20 degrees with contralateral uh, side and neck extension, right? The skin incision, it could be a question mark. It could be um, like an arch um, on cadavers. It's very difficult to retract tissues. So this is the one that gives you the most arch of dissection. We can see that soup Galial plain, key, important, loose areola. Then we can see the STA in its main trunk. And here's what I was telling you about, exposing and dissecting the STA from the galia. You can see that most of these little branches are going to escape, are going <laughs> to run away from, <coughs> from our dissection. So it's a very clean dissection to come from below. And this is the parietal branch of the SDA, the frontal remains um, perfusing our flap. Now let's review again where the two critical uh, structures are, the SDA and the facial nerve. Just another good one for a screenshot. <clears throat> the SDA between the skin and the galia, facial nerve between the galia and the superficial temporal fascia. I was telling you the posterior arc, third of the arch is a safe point to start. I palpate there. I raise that flap. In this case, we're doing a superficial flap. And you can see here the little artery. That's the middle temporal artery we just cut. It was perfusing. <coughs> it was a facial branch that perfuses the uh, facial, the deep temporal fascia at that level. So we dissect that fascia out of the orbitozygomatic rim. And the key part for that is to get from the underbelly of this bone, never to cut on top, but underneath. And with a periosteal elevator or um, <clears throat> pen fill one, you can just basically scrub it off from below to maintain the facial nerve. Here we uh, raise a rather big flap, which contains both the superficial temporal fascia and the pericranium. It's super big and it's pedicled here, pedicled by the supraorbital artery. We elevate the muscle next. And uh, the most important thing as the Japanese group um, popularized is to go superiosteal and to do so, the most important thing is to do this wipe maneuver from below to above, okay? Here we see some of the most important sutures. We saw the coronal, this is the squamosal. The sphenosquamosal is next. Then we can see 
the parietosphenoidal, frontosphenoidal, that all together, that H is the terion, right? Then the next is the frontozygomatic up top. You have <clears throat> this uh, zygomatic sphenoidal one and the frontozygomatic posteriorly. And there we go, we go with the dandiki hole for the terionol and below, uh, we could see the Macardi for the one piece. Here we're doing the two piece. This is nothing more than a terionol craniotomy, uh, a regular one. Again, you can do modifications of the main craniotomy specific for what you're intending to do. Uh, if you want to do the maximal exposure, and again, what we're showing here is the maximal exposure. You can always do less. You're doing a regular terional approach. The mini terional would be limiting that craniotomy to inferior to the superior temporal line where that temporal muscle attaches to. So here we have in the uh, craniotomy done. Remember at this point, uh, we're passing through the MMA on that suture. And <clears throat> here is uh, almost impossible to connect those cuts. We can do a little dislocation or fracture of the sphenoid ridge. And so here we have the terional, nothing fancy about this one. The next is going to be how to raise the orbitozygomatic osteotomy. And that's what uh, this um, talk is about. So we have the STA running on top. <clears throat> Important to see where is the root of the zygomatic arch. We <coughs> cut uh, and dislocate the masseter muscle. We can see that it's completely detached and that's gonna be important to raise it up. A modification of the orbit zygomatic approach would be to leave that zygomatic arch together with the master muscle and reattach it together. That's a modification that is there, it's published too. You see the two cuts on the zygomatic body and here on the dissector, I'm showing you that I'm entering the infraorbital fissure to connect these two cuts together. We mark the place for the <coughs> cranial plates uh, for later on. Although this V-shaped cut on the body of the zygoma will allow us to put it, connect it back together without problems. Next, we're drilling through the terion, through the sphenoid ridge. We will see the meningo orbital artery and the meningo orbital band. It's important to detach it. <coughs> Remember, for the orbital zygomatic, you want to go a little bit more medial than the meningo orbital band because you can actually you want to actually see the superior orbital fissure and its lateral projection for that guy. Now, here's what is difficult to understand. <coughs> when we try to understand this through cartoons or images. Now, it's very simple. We're gonna cut the orbital roof intracranially with some frontal retraction, <clears throat> and we are just lateral to the superorbital notch, which you can see um, on the right of my dissection. We're using, in this case, a sanapet. We can use a craniotome or oscillating saw. It's, we're using an oscillating saw, important to give a brain ribbon to protect the periorbita. Here, we are entering the superior orbital fissure, and then we're getting from the infraorbital fissure all the way to the supraorbital fissure. Important to preserve the periorbita again. And once we connect these two fissures, that's it. That's it. That's the key part that, um, in my experience, teaching is what confuses most of the people. And here we have the orbital zygomatic piece taken out. And here's important to understand, see the temporalis muscle goes all the way lateral and posterior out of the way, and we can see the periorbita. That's going to be our slope, our trajectory going down into that interpeduncular fossa. <coughs> all right. Now we can do one piece, and let's review that very simple, very fast. Um, again, it's the same position, but instead of starting with the first urinal approach, Terrial craniotomy, we're going to change a little bit. We start with the um, zygomatic arch cut, and the actual terrial craniotomy is going to be connected at the very end. So we have the McCarty keyhole again <coughs> with the orbital axis 
and the axis of the anterior cranial fossa. Now we have an axis that was not there that we created, the McCarty axis to the orbit. <coughs> so once we have the osteotomies both in the arch and the body of the zygoma, we're going to connect it to that McCarty keyhole, the orbital part of it, instead of the superior orbital fissure, which we cannot see. So we're going to do this cut. This cut can be done intraorbitally or extraorbitally. Basically, that's what we're doing. Do the orbital part. Next, <coughs> and this is the trickiest, most part of the orbital zygomatic one piece, we have to get with a craniotome inside or the sculptor inside of the, or the osteotome, inside of the cranial part of the macari, the cranial uh, section of the macari, and start that craniotomy, um, that orbitotomy <coughs> on the orbital roof. And after that, we will finish with that uh, final craniotomy. <laughs> <clears throat> At the end, we see a one-piece orbital zygomatic approach. And the main caveat of this one, the good is that basically the aesthetics are preserved as we don't have many cuts um, to put together. But um, that depends really on how you plan the cuts and how you put uh, these pieces back together. But the main caveat I want to show you is basically that you don't have much of orbital roof removed, you've not gotten into the superior orbital fissure. So you still have a lot of orbit um, roof remaining. Um, and so you have to take that later on. So it's not as efficient as it looks. It's not as controlled as the two Ps. We are not favoring it at this point, but it's there. It's good to know at least. All right. So let's see what's beyond the skull. And that's for the youngest in the audience. And we see that in the frontal bone, we have the frontal uh, lobe, but the frontal lobe also goes posterior and posterior to that coronal suture, which um, indicates the parietal. Then we have <coughs> the squam of the temporal relates to the temporal lobe. Uh, the, this is the, zyg the greater wing of this, uh, the sphenoid bone and the lesser wing is kind of basically the sphenoid ridge that gets us to the uh, temporal pole. And the zygomatic per se enters into the orbit. Just remember the layout of the frontal in purple and parietal in green. And most importantly, see that squamosal suture right there? That squamosal suture basically anticipates where the sylvian feature is going to be. So if we're doing a mini interior approach, it's important to make sure we have enough space above and below that uh, squamosal suture. Now, uh, some of the uh, geographics of the frontal operculum, we have the pars <coughs> orbitalis in 47, 45 is pars triangularis, and then we have posteriorly pars <coughs> opercularis. And the 44 pars opercularis typically where uh, we can anticipate Broca to be. Then we have the premotor area, the ocular fields in number eight. We have number four, which is the motor, three, one, two, which is the sensory, five and seven are the parietal lobe. Um, and then we have uh, 40 and 39. 40 is the supramarginal, 39 is the angular gyrus, the 22, which is the posterior temporal, and the 22 around 41, which is the auditory, is where, where Nike is. So very important to understand on the left side specifically, what are we dealing when we enter in the cilium fissure? And before we start dealing with the cilium fissure, greater thing to have is some kind of information of how the drainage of the veins is. And so just review very simple what the outflow or the drainage of the lateral surface of the brain is. Very simple. It's three main big channels. We can have a prominent labe draining inferiorly and posteriorly. We have a main trollar going up or a main <coughs> um, sylvian vein, a superficial uh, middle cerebral vein uh, together with a temporal uh, vein. And that, that 
would basically be along that cilium fissure trajectory and drain in the sphenoparietal sinus and get into the rosental system. So it's very important to understand where our patient lays on this uh, triad to see how loosely or how careful we have to be with that cilium vein. Now, obviously, the screenshot for the youngest in the audience, just to remind ourselves of the name of the 12th named um, M fours of the MCA. You had the temporal, polar, anterior temporal, middle temporal, posterior temporal. Very simple, right? Then, posterior to the posterior temporal, the temporal lobe is naturally going to get into the occipital. So we have the occipital temporal artery. Then, and uh, superior to that is the um, angular gyrus, so the angular artery, and then the supramarginal. Um, gyrus, we will have the posterior parietal, then anterior parietal in front. Extremely important, the central artery getting to the central sulcus, right? And then we can feed the frontal lobe with the precentral, prefrontal, and orbital frontal. Let's talk a little bit more about the sylvian fissure because this is going to be key for any zygomatic that requires a little bit of frontal or temporal dissection and retraction. So in this case, we're going to dissect from posterior to anterior. And one of the main ways to do so um, here at Barrow is to, we are taught, to follow an M4 into the M3, M2, and so forth <coughs> into the Sylvian system, right? And so extremely important is to understand the efficient that we can have two patterns of that uh, M4. We can have an M4 that goes straight uh, if we are in the frontal operculum into the superior trunk, or we can have a type B kind, which is basically a, an artery that takes a roundabout, gets into the contralateral operculum, gets some additions over there to continue into the ipsilateral trunk. So why is that important? Because that moves us in efficiently into our dissection of the cilia fissure. We can understand that we're following an M4 from frontal and gets to the temporal. That's not going to be many many reasons to not dissect it fast from that temporal operculum as we should not fear having a perforator over there. All right, let's move to another case. That is mine. And so it, this is just basically to show how to understand the layers of arachnoid when we are doing an orthozygomatic approach or a terrional, we're doing a cilium fissure approach. The first one is what we see right away. We see right away is the outer layer of the arachnoid. The outer layer basically covers the whole encephalon. It basically reaches from the surface into the, <clears throat> the skull base and the clivus. So this is a thick membrane. This is the membrane we need sharp dissection to start in. And so uh, for the cilian uh, cistern, this is going to be interesting because we have some membranes that are there regularly that get less attention. Let's see if we can play this one. And so the first step is going to be uh, dissecting on the outer layer. And you see another layer where the laser pointer is. That's a lateral sylvian membrane. And it's important why? Because it, it's, it's kind of a little shit of um, a little shit of arachnoid, like a little membrane of arachnoid that basically sandwiches the superficial, the sylvian vein, superficial sylvian vein. You can see here, sylvian vein, there's nothing else. The N4s to N3s are going to run outside of that um, uh, sandwich between the outer layer and the lateral sylvian membrane. And you see how thick it is. It's much thicker than anything else going down. It's not a web. It's really an outer, it's a membrane. And you can see here with this dissector how uh, strong it is for those who have uh, experience in the cilia fissure, obviously, you know that. That is interesting to know that those veins are encased between the outer layer and the lateral sylvian membrane. Let's review some other membranes on this <clears throat> little animation. With the, with dissected off the outer membrane, you see the vein, the sylvian uh, vein here. We see the lateral membrane, we get in, that's the intermediate membrane. And the intermediate membrane shows us the difference between M3s and M2s. We're now sitting on the insula. And so if we continue to dive in, we will see the proximal membrane. And the proximal membrane 
basically is encasing some of these lateral anticular striates. And what is the proximal um, membrane, cilia membrane? That's basically the lateral wall of the carotid cistern. So once we pass that, we're in carotid cistern territory. All right, so let's see a little bit more about the insula we were like stepping on um, right now. We've removed some of the opercula to show the anatomy very briefly. Let's see a little bit more detail. Not gonna go on detail about the um, insula just to show that there's two long gyrus, gyri, and three short gyri, just a caveat for those who want and know more. Um, at the tip of this blue little shape, you have the accessory gyrus, and that's the accessory gyrus that goes from the anterior gyrus down into the deep sylvian uh, fissure. And that in that transition is the apex of the insula. And in the anterior undersurface of the anterior short gyrus, so basically on your hand, right hand side on the blue, it's going to be the gyrus of Eberstaller. And the gyrus of Eberstaller and the accessory gyrus and the apex basically are where the <clears throat> uniform fasciculus is going to be uh, joining the temporal pole and the frontal pole where some of the gliomas go through. Now, another important thing for our uh, discipline, cerebrovascular and skull is understanding that when the M1 starts right after the um, apex of the insula, when we are in the li limit insula, which is that little rim from which we're gonna dive into the deepest part of the ceiling fissure, if we start on the M1 there, we have one centimeter, approximately one centimeter, until we get the first most distal lateral lenticular striate. So we'll have one centimeter of dissection until we have to mine the frontal lobe part of the M1 with the lateral lenticular striates. All right. Another important thing is we happen to see that sulcus where we have a difference between the <clears throat> long and short gyri, that's the central sulcus of the insula, the M2 that goes to the central sulcus of the insula develops into the central artery. And that's the one that reaches, as we saw, <coughs> motor and sensory primary area. So very important, if one needs to be uh, protected, that's the central M2. Okay, good, just a side note. There's about a hundred perforators of the M2s. 10% of them can be a long reach. These 10% on the posterior long gyri can reach to the internal capsule. Side note, so most of these perforators you see here are benign to take. They get to the extreme capsule, the claustrum, but they don't go through. Some 10%, they may cause problems. All right, now we see the cover and sinus. We're not gonna dive into it. It's just to show the couple triangles that we're going to use through the orbit zygomatic. You see the optic nerve, and you can see the third nerve and see the carotid. You have the optocarotid <coughs> triangle medial and the carotid oculomotor triangle lateral. We're going to use the carotid oculomotor triangle. <coughs> and this one, you can see here a left side transylvian dissection on this <coughs> carotid oculomotor triangle, and what we're seeing here is <coughs> the diencephalic <coughs> membrane of Lilliquist. And that's so critical. Why is it so important? Well, because that membrane, most of the times, is constant, has little perforators, and that's the main membrane that separates the fluid dynamics and the CSF, supra and infratentorial. So we're doing a ruptured aneurysm. We dissect <clears throat> the lamina terminalis cistern. We release the third ventricle over there. It would be a good idea to open the liliquist membrane to allow the flow to escape into cisterna magna and therefore prevent hydrocephalus in the late form. So other things that are important, the anterior clinoid for the youngest <clears throat> in the crowd, you see that that's a little bulge that continues with the tentorium on the left side. And 
the posterior clinoid because it's in relation with the third cranial nerve. So now we are um, in good orientation. I'm kind of running a little bit out of time. <clears throat> Just wanted to show you a couple of things in this animation. It's because we mentioned the Lilliquist <clears throat> and the Lilliquist membrane, you can see it here. You see the, op the optic nerve up top, the tentorium below. This is the lateral pontum mesencephalic membrane that reaches Lilliquist in the tentorium and the uncus, right? The, we're seeing the diencephalic up top that goes into the ma mammillary bodies. And we see the mesencephalic below, which uh, goes to the uh, ponto mesencephalic region. So when we enter, we see the mammillary bodies. We see the quadrifurcation of the basilar with a PCA coming out. We can see the third nerve. We can see the super, superior cerebellar artery. Turn around and we are like standing in front of the mammillary bodies and we can see here the dorsum cella with <coughs> the supracellular space. Okay, so we have the third cranial nerve in a subtemporal or pretemporal approach. We can get to this other triangle, which is the oculomotor tentorial triangle. Now, this does not require an orbit zygomatic to access, but this is to show you that through this triangle, we can get to the mid level of the basilar artery and the origin of the SCA. But if we want to go to the upper part of the pons or the mesencephalum, if that is falling short, we need a um, trajectory that's more parallel to the orbit in the periorbit, and that's what we're doing, that orbital zygomatic to get this final <clears throat> view between um, in the pons, in the lateral of the pons, between <clears throat> the PCA, the SCA, the third cranial nerve, and contralateral orbital zygomatic, you want to go medial to the oculomotor, as we can see that trajectory being the best. Now, <clears throat> these cuts in um, section of the mesencephalon are these two safe entry zones, quote unquote. The one in the midline is the midline <clears throat> interpeduncular. And then the lateral one, which is the one that we are gonna use today in the video from the, that I will show you about the cavernous malformation, that uh, goes right medial to the <clears throat> corticospinal tract, which you can see here in white. All right, let's jump into it. This is a video of my mentor, Dr. Lawton. It's a cavernous malformation of a <clears throat> patient let me thirties that had decreased right hand dexterity, increased right arm tingling, numbness to <coughs> the face, some ataxia, was misdiagnosed. It uh, bled before. It was not causing uh, uh, serious problems. So <clears throat> let's see if I can find the video controls. All right, skip into it. Uh, um, you can see them. Cavernous malformation in, in the pons, in the upper pons, lower midbrain. This relationship with the SCA, it's posterior to it, above and below. <clears throat> so in this case, Dr. Lawton decided to go for an orbit zygomatic approach. Uh, the uh, grading was a three because it presented as a chronic and we have a DVA on it. So basically we've discussed this, the surgical strategy was orbit zygomatic. Uh, in this case, we will see, pay attention, these big uh, superficial ciliary veins, the drainage of this lady was anterior. So we cannot um, transgress those veins. Uh, I know there are some extremely gifted uh, Japanese neurosurgeons that may divide it and stitch it back together. Uh, very dividing topic in the United States, preferred to save it. And if needed, you can transpose the superficial cilium vein by transposing the sphenoparietal sinus. We can see here the outer layer of the, mem of the arachnoid. And now on top and in between that superficial cilium vein, we're dissecting that lateral cilium <coughs> membrane. At the end, we were uh, going through the proximal cilium cistern, and now into the <coughs> chiasmatic um, arachnoid. And the reason we want to do um, access to 
The lamina terminal is cistern and the supraquiasmatic is uh, to get the frontal lobe released. Now we're cutting through the liliquous membrane. And so we have access to the interpeduncular cistern and the prepontine cistern. Now see that frontal lobe retraction. Otherwise, we would prefer to go uh, through that pretemporal route, but uh, that uh, tangling of veins uh, prevented it. So now we are cutting uh, down into the mesencephalic um, leaflet of Liliquis. We saw that cut and that allows us to enter into the prepontine uh, cistern. Now we are getting into that uh, lateral, or medial, medial lateral part of the pons, and we're getting to the cavernous malformation. In this case, was a very rock hard cavernous malformation. So here we see Dr. Lawton dissecting it out, um, attempting to take it uh, with pituitary rungers in a moment, but that, that was really, really strong um, main cavernous malformation. It comes out finally after. 360 dissection of it and dissecting it out um, from its adhesions and the remnants on the <coughs> resection bed. As you can see here, taking the last pieces of cavernous malformation. Let me advance because I feel we're getting a little late. Uh, this is the narrow corridor, the orozygomatic. It's very important in this case because. It allows us the light to go just probably interrupt, uninterrupted from the periorbital and the shaft of the instruments when you're getting in the posterior aspect of the cavernous malformation to basically tickle that periorbital. And so we need to get mu the muscle um, transposed and also not having the orbital rim here. We have the contralateral um, third nerve, the carotid and the ipsilateral third nerve on the left-hand side on that. Um, carotid oculomotor triangle. We're seeing the orbital zygomatic axis and this governor's malformation, which is, uh, was laying uh, medial to that corticospinal tract on the cerebral and the cerebral pedicle, as you can see here. This would be the um, safe entry zones. <clears throat> um, on the post-operative, the patient had a little bit of uh, kind of third <clears throat> nerve palsy. That recovered on <coughs> six month follow up. And here we have the post op uh, showing a complete resection on that cavernous malformation. So, that is just one example of uh, our indications for orthozygomatic uh, at the barrel at this point. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. I, I apologize for this uh, coughing recovery here. Uh, from the flu, um, it, it's it's indeed a great honor to be part of the ACNS, um, and hopefully, I inspired some young uh, neurosurgery residents or attendings to understand that the orbitozygomatic approach is just a puzzle that we can take advantage of the different pieces, and it's not a, a only one uh, technique. It's 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 basically an arsenal of different ways to get. Um, into the core of the scholars. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes, Dr. Gore, any comment? De Dianos, thank you very much for this beautiful presentation. I think you did a excellent review of the extracranial and intracranial anatomy of um, the frontotemporary region. And I think it is an, or it was a very nice propedeutic lecture for all residents and neurosurgeons. And thank you very much. So overall, it's difficult to discuss anatomy, but um, I think this review was excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a wonderful session. There are, uh, two specific things in this approach that uh, we are always wary about. So one thing is when you detach the periorbita from inside, the fat may protrude out due to some fractures in the peri uh, lining. That is one, uh, if that happens, the procedure becomes a whole messy. <laughs> Do you have any tips to avoid that? <laughs> That's absolutely true. Uh, <clears throat> 
I think that the key is to use. Um, so let me start with with my experience is that even if you do the tricks I'm going to say, which is the tricks that I've been taught at BNI, it breaks sometimes. And it depends on how fragile it is the tissue on some patients, it's impossible to preserve. When it breaks, um, it, 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 it's basically a balloon of fat. So what we do immediately is we don't persist in making a hole bigger. We use the bipolars at a low range and cauterize the fat and try to bring together the pieces of dura. Sometimes we can do a proline five if we can if we can get there soon enough and it's not a big opening. Um, the, the key here is to use, in our experience, a, a thin dissector, or if we can, if the orbit allows us, uh, pen fill one, and really scratch the bone. You, can, you wanna hear the bone scratching as you release the periorbita. And now the key other part is when you do the cuts, uh, if you do the oscillating saw, you need a brain ribbon, a retractor blade on the periorbital that you exposed. And you want to you, you wanna listen to the click. Uh, you want to feel actually the click of the oscillating saw into the brain ribbon. Uh, if you don't feel it, you are in the periorbital, right? Uh, we can use also the craniotome. Um, in my experience, if you have the bone cutting saw of uh, the ultrasonic aspirator, which is what I saw, what I show, um, it seems to be the most um, respectful to the periorbita. Then when, if you have big um, uh, openings, um, again, the bipolar, try to put some stitches, um, some suspensor, if you cannot bring them together. And then the, the, the dura is going to be reflected anteriorly. So during the approach, that fat is going to be basically covered by a layer of dura that is reflected anteriorly. So you can contain that and then try to repair it posteriorly after, after you're done. Right. Another thing is that unlike in cadavers, the temporalis muscle is very thick in actual when we are performing the operations. So you showed us two pieces that is uh do a craniotomy and the rest you take along actually the, many people you use it as three piece like first you fracture the zygoma and then you yep. do craniotomy and uh, uh, do it what we do is we do two piece like you fracture the zygoma and take the rest of it in one if i may show you one video that Please. i i have with me this is for demonstration this is for the case of a superior cerebellar artery and no, superior cerebral artery aneurysm that we did it some time back and we did a OZ for this as you see we have uh, preserved the facial nerve here and we are dissecting along and uh, this is the part of that uh, frontal sinus is a supraorbital nerve and uh, we try to fracture it and then uh, this is a temporalis we detach it all around and this is orbital rim lateral orbital rim and there you can see some fat protein you know, this is the keyhole and then we put another hole above and on the temporal side and then we cut this is the inferior orbital fissure to the uh, keyhole that we cut and then uh, the frontal we go beyond and that is the maximum limit we do not have an oscillating saw so we insert a retractor and this is the v-shaped cut that you were mentioning in your uh, lecture and that is a uh, part and we fracture it with a short chisel and then we cut uh, make a small uh, mark there with the craniotum and then we fracture it with the chisel the orbital uh, part and then it comes out in one piece so this is the how we do here beautiful uh, much much of the same that you do there <laughs> well thank beautiful. you we had a great session today and we learned a lot today regarding the nuances of uh, orbitozygomatic process so, so Gore, you can say the concluding remarks. Um, yes, I, th I think it was 
beautiful review of the anatomy. I think it was nice to see the one piece and two piece techniques by, by Arno. And what is useful in my opinion is to have a Sugita frame to retract the soft tissues. And in my opinion, um, you can close small holes in the periorbita also with Tahosil. So when you can manage to get one stitch to bring the layers a little bit together, then you can add one Tahosil to close it. And yeah, so I think it was at the end also very nice to see the, um, um, the, the deep approach to the brainstem using the space you can get removing the orbitozygomatic bone. Thank you very much, Arno. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, both the speaker and chairs. And I would like to conclude this officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Shin John Lin and Professor Arno Bennett, as well as the chairs, Professor Ryush Takanarita and Professor Felix Gore for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. A special thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. And we have around 500 people who watched us live. A special thanks also to my co-host Lyubun Singh for joining me today. So until we all meet on next Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.